Hello again. It's time to find out what happens next in our story, Charlotte's Web. This is the third part of the story, so if you haven't watched the videos that come before this, you probably should do to help this part make more sense. We had left Wilbur in a very, very rainy day, <clears throat> feeling very sad and lonely. He had just he had just said that he had no real friends and he was upset that Fern wasn't to come round and I just read Wilbur was crying again for the second time in two days. I'll carry on from here. At 6.30, Wilbur heard the banging of a pail. Lurvy was standing outside in the rain, stirring up breakfast. Come on, pig, said Lurvy, but Wilbur did not budge. Lurvy dumped the slops scraped the pail and walked away. He noticed that something was wrong with the pig. Wilbur didn't want food. He wanted some love. He wanted a friend, someone who would play with him. He mentioned this to the goose, who was sitting quietly in the corner of the sheepfold. Will you come over and play with me? he asked. Sorry, 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 said the goose. I am sitting, sitting on my eggs. Eight of them. Got to keep them toasty, oasty, oasty warm. I have to stay right here. I do not play when there are eggs to hatch. I am expecting goslings. Well, I didn't think you were expecting woodpeckers, said Wilbur rather bitterly. Wilbur next tried one of the lambs. Will you play with me? he asked. Certainly not, said the lamb. In the first place, I cannot get to your pen as I am not old enough to jump over the fence. In the second place, I am not interested in pigs. Pigs mean less than nothing to me. And there's the lamb who is talking to. What do you mean, less than nothing, replied Wilbur. I don't think there's any such thing as less than nothing. Nothing is absolutely the limit of nothingless. It's the lowest you can go. It's the end of the line. How can be something less than nothing? If there was something that was less than nothing, then nothing would not be nothing. It would be something, even if it was just a little bit of something. But if nothing is nothing, then nothing has nothing. Nothing has nothing that is less than it. Goodness, what a confusing sentence. Oh, be quiet, said the lamb. Go play by yourself. I don't play with pigs. Sadly, Wilbur lay down and listened to the rain. Soon he saw the rat climbing down a slanting board that he used as a stairway. Will you play with me, Templeton? asked Wilbur. Play, said Templeton, twirling his whiskers. Play, I hardly know the meaning of the word. Well, said Wilbur, it means to have fun, to frolic, to run and skip and be berry. Me be merry, excuse me. I never do those things if I can avoid them, replied the rat sourly. I prefer to spend my time eating, gnawing, spying and hiding. I am a glutton but not a merrymaker. Right now I am on my way to your trough to eat your breakfast, since you haven't got sense enough to eat it yourself. And Templeton the rat crept stealthily along the wall, and disappeared into a private tunnel that he had dug between the door and the trough in Wilbur's yard. Templeton was a crafty rat, and he had things pretty much his own way. The tun tunnel was an example of his skill and cunning. The tunnel enabled him to get from the barn to his hiding place under the pig trough without coming out in the open. He had tunnels and runways all over Mr Zuckerman's farm and could get from one place to another without being seen. Usually he slept during the daytime and was awake only after dark. Why do you think the rat wants to hide himself from the Zuckermans so much? Wilbur watched him disappear into his tunnel. In a moment, he saw the rat's sharp nose poke out from underneath the wooden trough. Cautiously, Templeton pulled himself up over the edge of the trough. This was almost more than Wilbur could bear. On this dreary, rainy day, to see his breakfast being eaten by somebody else. 
He knew Templeton was getting soaked by the rain, but even that did not comfort him. Friendless, dejected, hungry, he threw himself down in the manure and he sobbed. Oh, poor Wilbur. Can you see that? Late that afternoon, Lurvy went to Mr Zuckerman. I think there's something wrong with that pig of yours. He's not touched his food. We'll give him two spoonfuls of sulphur and uh, a little molasses, said Mr Zuckerman. Wilbur couldn't believe what was happening to him when Lurvy caught him and forced the medicine down his throat. This was certainly the worst day of his life. He didn't know whether he could endure the awful loneliness any more. Darkness settled over everything. Soon there were only shadows and the noises of the sheep chewing their cuds and occasionally the rattle of a cow chain up overhead. You can imagine Will was surprised then when out of the darkness came a small voice he had never heard before. It sounded rather thin but pleasant do you want a friend, Wilbur? It said. I'll be a friend to you. I've watched you all day, and I like you. But I can't see you, said Wilbur, jumping to his feet. Where are you, and who are you? I'm right up here, said the voice. Go to sleep. You'll see me in the morning. Now, spend a moment having a think about maybe another animal that that could be. Quite a thin, pleasant voice. And I've just read, I'm right up here. Chapter five next, and it's called Charlotte. The night seemed long. Wilbur's stomach was empty and his mind was full. And when your stomach is empty and your mind is full, it is always hard to sleep. A dozen times during the night, Wilbur woke and stared into the blackness, listening to the sounds and trying to figure out what time it was. A barn is never perfectly quiet. Even at midnight, there's usually something stirring. The first time he woke, he heard Templeton gnawing a hole in the grain bin. Uh, grain is what they feed many animals with on a farm. Templeton's teeth scraped loudly against the wood and it made quite a racket. That crazy rat, thought Wilbur. Why does he have to stay up all night grinding his clashes, that must be grinding his teeth, and destroying people's property? Why can't he go to sleep like any decent animal? The second time Wilbur woke, he heard the goose turning on her nest and chuckling to herself. What time is it? whispered Wilbur to the goose. Probably, obably, obably, about half past eleven, said the goose. Why aren't you asleep, Wilbur? Too many things on my mind, said Wilbur. Well, said the goose, that's not my trouble. I have nothing at all on my mind, but I've got too many things under my behind. Have you ever tried to sleep while sitting on eight legs? No, replied Wilbur. I suppose it is very uncomfortable. How long does it take a goose egg to hatch? Approximately, approximately 30 days, all told, answered the goose. But I cheat a little. On warm afternoons, I pull a little straw over the eggs and I go out for a walk. Wilbur yawned and went back to sleep. In his dreams, he heard the voice saying, I'll be a friend to you. Go to sleep. You'll see me in the morning. About half an hour before dawn, you know when dawn is, when the sun comes up. Wilbur woke and listened. The barn was still dark. The sheep lay motionless. Even the goose was now quiet. Overhead on the main floor, nothing stirred. The cows were resting and the horses dozed. Templeton had quit work and gone off somewhere on an errand. You know, on doing a job for somebody. The only sound was a slight scraping noise on the rooftop where the weather vane swung back and forth. Wilbur loved the barn most when it was like this, calm and quiet, waiting for light. Day is almost here, he thought. Through a small window, a faint gleam appeared. What do you think the word gleam means? 
One by one the stars went out and Wilbur could see the goose a few feet away. That should give you a bit of a clue about the word gleam. A gleam is a bit like a glint, it's a little bit of light. Goose sat with her head tucked under a wing. He could see the sheep and the lambs as the sky lightened. Oh, beautiful day, it is here at last. Today I shall find my friend. Wilbur looked everywhere. He searched his pen thoroughly. He examined the window ledge, stared up at the ceiling, but he saw nothing new. Finally, he decided he would have to speak up. He hated to break the lovely stillness of dawn by using his voice, but he couldn't think of any other way to locate his mysterious friend, who was nowhere to be seen. So, Wilbur cleared his throat. <coughs> Attention, please he said in a loud, firm voice. Will the party who addressed me at bedtime last night kindly make himself or herself known by giving an appropriate sign or signal? He's gone to his very, very official voice there. And that's why he used the word party in a very different way to the way that you or I would do. For us, is a party is something you go to to celebrate a birthday. But in this sentence, will the party who addressed me, that means will the person who addressed me. Wilbur paused and he listened. All the other animals lifted their heads and stared at him. Wilbur blushed. Why did he blush? He was a bit embarrassed. But he was determined to get in touch with his unknown friend. Attention please, he said again. I will repeat the message. Will the party who addressed me at bedtime last night kindly speak up? Please tell me where you are, if you are my friend. The sheep, sheep looked at each other in disgust. Stop your nonsense, Wilbur, said the oldest one. If you have a new friend here, you are probably disturbing his rest, and the quickest way to spoil a friendship is to wake somebody up in the morning before he is ready. How can you be sure your friend is an early riser? I beg everyone's pardon, whispered Wilbur, which is a sort of another way of saying I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be objectionable. There's a very old fashioned word that means being a bit of a nuisance. He lay down meekly in the manure, facing the door. He didn't know it, but his friend was very near and the old sheep was right. The friend was still asleep. Soon Lurvy appeared with slops for breakfast and this time Wilbur rushed out, ate everything in a hurry and licked the trough. The sheep moved off down the lane, the gander waddled along behind them pulling grass and then just as Wilbur was settling down for his morning nap he heard again the thin voice that had dressed him the night before. Salutations said the voice. And salutations just kind of means hello. Now I asked you to think about what kind of animal could have a thin but pleasant voice and would say to Wilbur I'm right up here. You were going to have a guess about what animal you thought it would be. I think we might find out whether or not you're right. Wilbur jumped to his feet. Sell you what? he cried. Salutations replied the voice. What are they? And where are you? screamed Wilbur. Please, please tell me where you are. And what are salutations? Well, salutations are greetings, said the voice. When I say salutations, it's just my fancy way of saying hello or good morning. Just like I said. Actually, it's a silly expression and I'm surprised that I used it at all. As for my whereabouts, that's easy. Look up here in the corner of the doorway. Here I am. Look, I'm waving. So another clue there, if you haven't figured out what animal this could be, they are found in the corner of a doorway. I hope I haven't got any in the corner of my doorway. Just having a quick check. At last, Wilbur saw the creature that had spoken to him in such a kindly way. Stretched across the upper part of the doorway was a big spider's web, of course. There was a big clue in the title there. The animal we're talking about is a spider. She, in fact, is a large grey spider. 
She was about the size of a gumdrop. Now that's an American sweetie, a chewy sweetie, maybe about this small. She had eight legs and she was waving one of them at Wilbur in a friendly greeting. See me now? she asked. Oh yes indeed, said Wilbur. Yes indeed. How are you? Good morning. Sal sal salutations. Very pleased to meet you. What is your name, please? May I have your name? My name, said the spider, is... Yep, Charlotte. Charlotte what? asked Wilbur eagerly. Charlotte A. Kovatica. But you can just call me Charlotte. I think you're beautiful, said Wilbur. Well, I am pretty, replied Charlotte. Hmm. There's no denying that. Almost all spiders are nice looking. I'm not as flashy as some, but I, I'll do. I wish I could see you, Wilbur, as clearly as you can see me. And there is an illustration to show you her spider's web and sort of roughly what size she is compared to Wilbur. Uh, she's just said, I do wish I could see you, Wilbur, as clearly as you can see me. Well, why can't you see me, asked the pig. I'm, I'm right here. Yes, but I'm nearsighted, said Charlotte. I've always been dreadfully nearsighted. It's good in some ways, not so good in others. So if she's nearsighted, that means she's short-sighted. Like me, I need glasses to see things a long way away. I can only see things close to me without my glasses. That's going to be useful for her as a spider. In fact, she, she said, didn't she? It's good in some ways, but not so good in others. Watch me wrap up this fly. A fly that had been crawling along Wilbur's trough had flown up and blundered into the lower part of Charlotte's web and was tangled in the sticky threads. The fly was beating its wings furiously, trying to break loose and free itself. First, she said Charlotte, I dive at him. She plunged head first towards the fly. As she dropped, a tiny silken thread unwound from her rear end. Next, I wrap him up. She grabbed the fly, threw a few jets of silk round it and rolled it over and over, wrapping it so that it couldn't move. Wilbur watched in horror. He could hardly believe what he was seeing. And although he did detest flies, he felt quite sorry for this one. There, said Charlotte. Now I knock him out so he'll be a bit more comfortable. Knock him out means to make something unconscious, kind of like you're asleep. She bit the fly. He can't feel a now thing. She can't feel... Let me start again. He can't feel a thing now, she remarked, and he'll make the perfect breakfast for me. Not sure I would enjoy flies for my breakfast. You mean you eat flies, gasped Wilbur. Certainly. Flies, bugs, grasshoppers, choice beetles, moths, butterflies, tasty cockroaches, gnats, midges, oh I do like a daddy long legs, centipedes, mosquitoes, crickets even, anything that's careless enough to get caught in my web. I have to live, don't I? Well yes of course, said Wilbur. Do they taste good? Delicious. Of course I don't really eat them. Gruesome bit coming up. I drink them, she said. Drink their blood. I love blood, said Charlotte, and her pleasant thin voice grew even thinner and more pleasant. I don't think I like the idea of that very much. We've got a picture here. You can just see how she's wrapped up that fly. Now I'm going to leave the story there for now. We'll find out what happens next in this chapter all about Wilbur and Charlotte and find out more what happens to the story next time. Until then... Bye for now.